Good morning, this is Dr. Mike, and I'm really happy to be able to share some thoughts with you in this week six of our study. We're really closing in on the final weeks, and I wanted to spend just a few moments talking about the uh, context of the American Revolution, and that's kind of what you're talking about this week. Uh, the kid book is a really good book, really good author. Uh, I'm a little prejudiced because uh, he's uh, he did his undergraduate work at Clemson, where I did, uh, but he is a good author, and I think you can find a great deal uh, of value in the reading of the textbook. So let me encourage you to uh, to do that. Um, the beginnings, the precursors, if you will, of the American Revolution, I like to think was the first Great Awakening, the big religious revival that came about uh, in, the, in the early 1700s uh, with men like John Wesley and uh, George Whitfield. John Wesley was the founder of the Methodist Church in England, and he came here on several occasions. In fact, both preachers came here for a reason, because the British were in this deal of, of getting rid of their malcontents and their undesirables. And so what they did was they cleaned out their debtors' prisons, and they dumped whole families in Georgia. Uh, and those people were not trained or, or had any abilities to plant crops or farm or do anything else to feed themselves. And many of the parents died, leaving a large, large number of orphans in Georgia. And so Whitfield and Wesley came here on a religious mission of the Anglican Church in order to talk about uh, preparing a or building an orphanage. Uh, Wesley didn't stay as much, didn't come as often as Whitfield did. And of course, when the revolution happened, Wesley never came back again because he disagreed with uh, the American colonies rebelling against uh, England. And so the Methodist Church in America uh, was carried on by others. And so the, uh, he didn't have a whole lot to do with it after that. Both men remained within the Anglican Church, although they were also outside the Anglican Church, uh, because the Anglicans did not have any provision for reaching the masses of people because they believe very strongly in Calvinism and in uh, predestination and election, and they believe that the signs of that election were the blessings on your uh, your uh, prosperity. So if you had land, were wealthy, well-to-do, uh, you were the elect. If you were poor and starving, then that was a sign of God's disfavor and the fact that you were unelect. And if you weren't elected for he heaven, then you were elected for hell. So why waste space in trying to reach people with a gospel they could not accept, could not believe, could not be saved. This is where Whitfield's going to make a major difference because he goes into the highways and hedges to use a biblical term and begin to speak to the masses. Uh, he spoke many times to thousands. In fact, Benjamin Franklin, who was an agnostic, maybe an atheist, uh, was very curious about his voice and about the ability uh, to reach so many thousand people, like in the Boston Common or in Philadelphia in the Square. And so he would all, he would always go to Whitfield's sermons and transcribe those. And he actually made money, became wealthy, selling uh, sermons on the streets of Philadelphia, printing them and selling them for a nickel. Uh, but he also would do these tests. Franklin was known for running these tests. In fact, Later, when he went to the to England or to France as the emissary for the colonies, uh, he was usually hanging over the side of the ship measuring currents. And once he had uh, developed the currents of the Atlantic Ocean, uh, it made great inroads in a speedier trip where it normally took months to get to England. They shortened it down to like two months. It was about six down to two because he studied the currents and the and. The, if they would follow the wind and the and the current, then they would it would save them a lot of time. And so things like that was just vintage Franklin. Of course, he invented the Franklin stove. He invented all kinds of things that we still use today. Many of them are are, are facsimiles of them. But he was interested in Whitfield's voice being able to reach such a vast multitude, and so he did test on the limits and how many people were were there and made an estimate that, yes, he could reach 20,000 people without PA systems uh, and preach th to them the gospel. And these people came flocking uh, and converted because no church had ever paid any attention to them before. They didn't care. They didn't try to reach them. And so this was a very fruitful ministry 
for Whitfield, both in England and in America. Uh, the other interesting thing about that was he stayed with Franklin many times when he was in Philadelphia, uh, and Franklin said he often tried to convert him, but to no avail, but they became really good friends, which should teach us a lesson. You don't have to, you know, you can be friends with anybody. You can enjoy a friendship with everybody. So, but anyways, the main thing about this religious revival that's so important in terms of the revolution was that it broke one of the power structures that controlled people, and that was religion and the church. Uh, and so when that kind of dissipated and, and went away, and of course the Anglicans went, dropped in numbers and other groups like the Baptist and the Methodist uh, grew in numbers, uh, then of course that was a very, very much a change in how church polity went because the Baptists and Methodists were much more laity oriented and not a priesthood and different things. Now, let me remind you, there was no Pentecostal movement until the 1860s. That came with the Second Great Awakening, uh, and we probably won't get to talk too much about that, but maybe. Uh, and there was a lot of difference in that. Now, Mr. Kidd uh, has a very a unique theory, and that is that he doesn't believe there were two awakenings. He believed it was just one continual awakening, which I tend to agree with him on that. Uh, I thought a great deal about that. So one didn't ever stop. They just transposed into a different preachers and different eras. So about 1840, uh, you know, other people took up the the mantle of revival. But the first Great Awakening uh, really kind of uh, startled people into realization of, of personal freedom. They didn't have any of that before. It's hard for us to wrap our minds around what it would have been like to live in the 1700s and to live under British rule. Many of you have tried to get you to think in terms of everybody here is British. The the colonials and the, the British, all these are British citizens. They're not some unique American. Uh, you don't get the concept of American identity until after the War of 1812, when Britain is finally expelled and uh, you know, from the from the continental United States. And so you begin to get this thought process of what does it mean to be an American? Because once the war was over, uh, and I really don't think they ever started the war thinking that they would leave England, but that England would give them the things that they demanded. Uh, but when the war was over, they uh, realized, hey, we're on our own now, and we're open to, you know, the, the attacks of our enemies, uh, you know, France and Britain were at war. And so the British would attack American ships and take British speaking. And remember, most of these colonials had a British accent too. They're still very much, very new away from the British empire. It took a long time for that accent to, to dissipate and go away. And, uh, you know, the Brits were always worried about Americans losing their sense of civilization. They, they looked at being civilized as this coat you would just put on and wear it. And it was just so easy to shed that and go out and, you know, live in the wild and be a fur trapper for six months and be away from other humans and other people that spoke English. You could, you kind of lose the manners and things that you had learned as an Englishman. And so they looked on these new colonials in America as kind of crude, rude, and uncalled for, unmannered, un, un, you know, just not really important humans. So those are some very interesting things that just to mention to you in passing. So don't get the idea that these are somehow Americans versus the Brits, even in the things that led up to the war. Uh, one thing about the, I may have mentioned this last week, I'm not sure if I, I don't remember correctly, uh, but there is a whole side to the British side of the American conflict that uh, you need to read in order to get a full picture. Don't ever take as a historian, don't ever take just one side of the story and expect that to be the truth. You need to look at all sides and weigh the evidence. But you can go and look at British newspapers during the time and 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 speak the speeches from the House of Parliament and things of that nature. I think I mentioned to you the book I reviewed called The Last King in America. King George actually was probably bipolar, and he spent a great deal of time in bed, incapacitated, and we never knew that until just recently. And that incapacitation made the, his lords and the people that ran the government gave them, it emboldened them to do and what their own programs. And so that is that is of great importance. So there's a lot of factors that influence 
the revolution. The other fact I do want to mention to you again is that the founding fathers who started this battle with Britain were not uh, low-class poor people. They were elites and wealthy. And when we talk about the Stamp Act, the Tax Act, all those things, that didn't apply very much to the to the run-of-the-mill uh, colonial. It applied to people that had businesses and wealthy people that sent documents because you had to have a stamp on every document and you had to pay for that. Well, poor people didn't do that. Uh, they also didn't have glass in their windows. Uh, there was a tax on imported glass for you that you put in your windows for, and uh, poor people didn't have those in their house. Uh, they had pretty much a porthole that they opened and closed with a wooden door and they could shoot at people or Indians from there and defend themselves. But they, they just, most of the poor people's houses were dark, unlit, no sunlight and, uh, where you know wealthier you are, the more you have glass panes in the window, especially in the New England area where it's really cold and bitter and brutal in the winter time. Uh, the average temperature of the average Puritan uh, in the 1600s they have computed to be about uh, 43 degrees. That's as warm as it got inside your house. Think of that. So you have this. You have to sell this war. Uh, we have to sell. You have to sell every war. You have to sell. We have to sell the Civil War, the War of eighteen twelve, World War One, all of that, because there is always a large number of people that just don't want to go to war, no matter what the conditions are. And so the, you've got to realize that the population pretty much split right down the middle. It was about fifty percent patriots and fifty percent loyalists. The loyalists were 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 loyal to England. And the Patriots wanted to were participating in this war. They may not have had the concept of, of freedom yet. That didn't come, I don't think, till well up in the war. Kind of like in the Civil War, uh, the idea of the Emancipation Proclamation from Lincoln did not come until the the Gettysburg War, War at Gettysburg, and that was well into the war. So these things evolve and develop, but the idea of freedom uh, probably wasn't on their on their front burner. They just wanted their rights and. They felt like they were being infringed upon by these taxes. And so Thomas Paine wrote the book Common Sense in order to, to grab people's attention and to try to bring in the lower classes into this war by talking about the fact that how uh, England had in, in, in interfered and came into their, you know, their, their lives and made it hard. Uh, and so they convinced people to, to join the, uh, to join the battle. So those are things that happen. So uh, several Congresses uh, met to discuss the facts of what was going to happen uh, and how it was going to happen, how they're going to pay for it. That, of course, was another issue because the American colonies had no money. Uh, they would hope that the French would uh, come in because of their hatred of England. They did finally come in at the last minute, and they were the ones that were the heroes of the day because when Cornwallis finally got back to Yorktown, Washington was in place, cut him off and drove him back to the sea where he planned to get on uh, British ships and sail away, and the French showed up and blocked their access. So that was the end of the war. But uh, so there was no money there. They, I mean, they commissioned uh, George Washington as the commander uh, to be honest with you, George Washington was not that great of a general. Uh, he was good at making armies disappear when they got trapped on one side of the river. I mean, he could move a whole army overnight by boat to the other side of the river and out of danger. He did that several times. Now, they did have one very successful battle on Christmas Eve uh, against the Hessians. Uh, the, British hired, um, the British hired mercenaries to come to America because of their, their financial problems in England. Their soldiers were needed to protect England from being invaded by their enemies, by France and the Germans and all this. And so they, they were really caught in a bind. And that's the thing that, that I don't want you to miss in this discussion. It wasn't just England being mean and nasty to the colonials. They were, they were really in a bind. They'd been involved in this hundred years war over religion ever since the Reformation almost. And uh, they were involved and it was a world war. It's the first world war. Everywhere England had uh, space, they, uh, they were fighting the French or whoever. And that's what brought them to America. 
what we call the French and Indian War was a continuation of this Hundred Years War going on in Europe. So it, it, it bled over into the American colonies. And lest you forget, the American colonies were not the diamond in the ring of England's empire. We were not that important. We didn't get stuff that was just absolutely, we didn't make things that were irreplaceable or share raw materials that were irreplaceable. The, the real jewel of the empire would be, you know, the uh, Bahamas where they made sugar. Sugar was a high commodity market. They used it to make molasses and they used the molasses to make alcohol. And so there was a lot of money that came out of that. And so we weren't the top uh, reason on their, on their list to protect and to keep from danger, but they did do it because they didn't want to give anything up to the French. And so they, they sent Hessians here who were notoriously brutal uh, soldiers and uh, who fought for money and they would rape and pillage and destroy anybody that they, uh, that they encountered. Uh, it's been accused by the British. It was the Hessians in South Carolina that locked the people in the church and burned the church down with them inside it. I hope you've seen the movie Patriot. I encourage you to do that. That movie was about Cornwallis and how South Carolina basically helped to win the war. Uh, our delaying tactics in South Carolina slowed Cornwallis down enough to where he got back at Yorktown late and then got captured and then the war was over. So South Carolina played a huge role in that. So I want you to know that just a, a, there's a lot of different uh, layers to this story. Uh, and as a, as a historian, you need to be very careful about taking sides about you want to know all the all of the sides and then you want a nuanced approach to that you don't want to you know be careful we don't use uh superlatives the best the greatest because you can't prove that you can't prove that george washington was the greatest president or whatever you but you can prove the statement like he was one of the great presidents or lincoln was one of the great presidents or you know, whoever it is. So be sure when you're writing that you kind of scale back that tendency to be grandiose and say that he was the greatest, he was the best, he was the most honest. You have no measure to to measure that against uh, to be sure that it's correct. So I hope these thoughts have, have helped you in some way with this week's discussion. As you read, do your work. I am more than happy to answer questions or come up with anything you need to have an answer for, please let me know that. I will th we'll see you next week. And until then, thank you for your great work.